Located high on the Andean plateau of South America, in the country of Bolivia, can be found the ruins of a once mighty civilization, and amongst them the clues to one of history's most unique and enduring mysteries. What was this place? When was it built? How in the world did these people survive in ancient times, at nearly 13,000 feet or 4,000 meters of altitude, well above the tree line, in a place seemingly antithetical to large populations and civilization itself? Why build a city here, where crops are difficult to grow, and the struggle for simple existence is a daily battle? And then there's the form of the city itself. Just how was this stonework achieved? Some of the remnants left to us are both unique and utterly remarkable in their design. A seemingly playful style of endless, perfectly shaped corners, angles, channels, and even tiny drilled holes, formed with an obvious mechanical precision into very hard stone, an aspect of these ruins that is rarely explored and then never by the mainstream. Known today as the twin sites of Tiwanaku and Pumapunku, there has been considerable controversy around just when they were originally built. If you ask mainstream academia, the consensus is generally that it was founded around 110 AD and went on to eventually collapse around 1000 AD. This estimation of the age of Tiwanaku, made around 2012, is derived entirely from the results of C14 radiocarbon dating and another technique known as obsidian hydration dating. And although there have been carbon-14 results from organic material found at the site going back to 1500 BC, these results have been dismissed as unreliable. Even so, this date of 1500 BC isn't close to the date suggested by other evidence for the true age of this mysterious megalithic city in Bolivia. The man who was responsible for the vast majority of the excavation, research and even protection of the site in our modern era was Professor Arthur Poznanski, an Austrian born in Vienna in 1873, and he spent nearly 50 years working, researching and publishing on Tiwanaku, work for which he was widely recognized for in Bolivia before eventually passing away in La Paz in 1946. Just a year before that, in 1945, his life's work was culminated in the production of the magnificent volumes known as Tiwanaku, the Cradle of American Man. These books are hard to find and quite expensive when you do, but thanks to the supporters of this channel in the last couple of years, I've been able to source them and will be their caretakers for a while as I use them for research and share the results with you all here. In Poznanski's work spread across four volumes that span a vast array of topics, he dates not the founding of the city, but rather the second period of occupation at Tiwanaku to the period around 15,000 BC. That's 17,000 years ago, a date unsurprisingly scoffed at by modern academia, who point to radiocarbon dating as a rebuttal, and on that basis simply dismiss Poznanski's work. But just how valid is this dismissal? After all, carbon-14 dating might just be the last time somebody was buried there, or started a campfire there. It says nothing about the age of the stonework itself. Although Poznanski's research was done before radiocarbon dating was a thing, he didn't just pull the figure of 15,000 BC from thin air. Rather, it is the result of studies of the geological and climatic history of the region, connections to now-extinct flora and fauna, semi-fossilized animal remains, folklore, cultural history, and Tiwanaku's connections to other ancient cities of the Americas, studies of erosion at the site, and most significantly, astronomical dating based on the alignment of a structure known as the Kalasasaya, which is much more than simply a ceremonial space. It is, in fact, a very accurately constructed solar observatory. Quoting Arthur Poznanski from his summary in the chapter of the probable age of Tiwanaku, Quote, if one wished to collect all of the ideas about the great age of the civilization of Tiwanaku with the attendant bases and proofs, one could fill a whole book. But we feel certain that in the preceding paragraphs we have outlined in a clear and synthetic form the nature of such proofs, which are astronomical, anthropological, paleontological, geological, petrographic and sociological. By consulting the literature cited in the notes accompanying the text, 
complete and precise information may be had about all the subjects which have been treated very hastily in the present chapter. End quote. Funnily enough, and despite mainstream archaeology's brusque dismissal of Poznansky's primary work, much of his observations in these history-adjacent scientific fields like geology and astronomy have in fact been validated and strengthened by modern research in recent years. So, where does the truth lie here? I hope you'll join me as we investigate just what's behind these claims and see if we can shed some light on the possible origins of one of history's most unique puzzles, the incredible remains of Tiwanaku and Pumapunku, high up on the Altiplano of Bolivia. I have produced a video on this site in the past, a couple of years ago now. It's an overview of the various complexes and an introduction to the forms of stonework that you can find here. We also get into some of the recent discoveries and issues surrounding the site, the orthodox dating timeline, and some of the connections to other ancient cultures, so check out that video if you're looking for an introduction. In this video, we're going to dive into the specifics of the dating claims around Tiwanaku and provide some context by explaining the phases of occupation, as well as the construction and destruction that has occurred here. We'll also leverage Posnansky's amazing documentation and take a look at the architecture of the various complexes on the site and how those have changed since he began his work in the early 20th century. Speaking of Posnansky's work, these really are some amazing books. Large cloth-bound volumes with many meticulous drawings, photographs, maps, and foldouts, and I'm thankful to be the caretaker for these for a while. I am in the process of slowly digitizing and photographing them, and I'll be making the chapters and resources quoted in this video available for patrons and channel members, as a small token of appreciation for supporting Uncharted X. I've also done this with other rare books as well as my LiDAR scans from ancient sites around the world. If you're interested in these resources or in supporting the channel, please do check out my Patreon or the Join button here on YouTube, or any of the other value for value methods at the support page on my website at unchartedx.com support. Arthur Posnansky titled Tiwanaku the Cradle of American Man for good reason, as he believed that once Tiwanaku itself became unlivable, for reasons that we'll get into, its inhabitants slowly spread out into the Americas and left their cultural legacy and clues within later ancient civilizations for us to decode today. In a previous video, South America's megalithic age, link is below, I highlighted one of these connections, the art style and symbology that is shared between Tiwanaku and Chavan de Huanta, a site that goes back as far as 3000 BC located in the northern mountains of Peru, with its famous Ramondi stele and anthropomorphic idols and artwork, much of which is found in underground labyrinths. Another strong cultural connection between Tiwanaku and later civilizations is that it seems to have been the genesis for the well-known Chicana, the stepped motif that is also known as the Incan cross. This can be found across many existing sites, particularly those attributed to the Inca. The Inca associated this stepped shape to the three planes of existence as part of their mythology, and I've explored this concept in more depth in my video on the mysterious megalithic cave of Napahuaca, again the links below. Poznansky documents many more connections between the culture of Tiwanaku and those of presumably later ancient civilizations, as shown by this map, illustrating the radiation of cultural indicators into not just South America, but also Central and North America. Quoting Professor Poznansky from his prologue, quote, Up to this time, there has been studied with considerable care the interesting prehistoric culture of northern Argentine and still more the vast patrimony left by the ancients in the Grand Peru, Central America, Mexico and the United States. But until the present, there has not been discovered the foundation of South American culture, the ascensional ladder leading to the relatively high cultural stage at which the peoples of this hemisphere were found by the European conquistadors upon their new arrival. We call it new because America had been visited previously by Europeans, as has been proved beyond all doubt from the latest studies and discoveries. On the other hand, only very superficial investigation has been given the great civilization that flourished thousands of years ago on the lofty plateau encompassed by the Andes. Today, this region is at a very great height above sea level. 
In remote periods, it was lower and possessed climatic conditions conductive to the creation and the well-being of large human groups. Here, the struggle for existence was not arduous. As a result, there developed a stable life, a settled one, which permitted the perfecting of a noble art, adequate moral customs, laws regulating social conduct, and fairly advanced agricultural methods based upon an elaborate astronomical science. But nothing endures forever. Great civilizations are destroyed, and new ones are engendered, sometimes inferior, occasionally superior to those that went before. Thus it befell the metropolis of Timunaku. Having reached in very remote times almost the apogee of the civilization then attainable, it declined rapidly because of adverse geological changes. Since the surroundings were impaired, malign climatic conditions arose. Climatic aggression put a walking staff into the hands of the dwellers upon the Altiplano, forcing them to go on and on, until they found suitable locations where they could again establish themselves and enjoy the fruits of their labours. These emigrants then, carrying with them their cultural baggage, spread throughout all those parts of the hemisphere which still remained unaffected by the climatic aggression, disseminating as they went their enlightenment and beliefs. End quote. The possibility of civilizations existing in South America many thousands of years ago isn't just an idea unsupported by evidence, quite the contrary. While the most well-known culture of the region, that of the Inca, thrived during a short period in relatively recent times, the 14th to 16th century AD, many researchers speculate that it was itself built upon the ruins of a long-gone and undocumented megalithic civilization. This idea is supported by analysis of the stonework, architecture, and the timeline of the 13 successive High Inca rulers. I've explored these topics in some depth in several videos. Links to those are also below in the description. There are, however, other sites and evidence for older civilizations outside of the Inca. In the highlands to the northeast of Lima, the site of Chavan de Huanta, or Chavan Temple, as mentioned earlier, has a history stretching back 5,000 or more years with radiocarbon results from around 3000 BC, as well as evidence for massive megalithic work found on the site. It's a beautiful and remote place, one that I visited in 2016, and research on the site shows a direct connection to the culture of Tiwanaku. Another connection between these sites can be found in the evidence for low stepped pyramids, which were features of both locations. The structure at Tiwanaku, known as the Akapana, although covered in sediment today, is in fact a large stepped pyramid with a reservoir in its center. Another pyramid site exists in Peru, on the coastal deserts north of Lima, known as Corral. Here also, there is strong evidence dating this site back to at least the time of the Old Kingdom in Egypt, some 5,000 years ago, around 3000 BC. Corral is still actively being excavated and researched, but it features at least a dozen low-stepped pyramid structures. I hope to produce dedicated videos for both Corral and Chavan at some point in the future. So, if we go with Poznansky's theory that adverse geological changes and climatic aggression put a walking stick in the hands of the people of Tiwanaku, who then migrated north, possibly forming the origins of other known ancient civilizations, what specifically is he referring to? The geological history of Lake Titicaca, the Andes and the Altiplano of Bolivia is complex, and the academic claims that have been made about this region over the last 150 years are varied and have changed over time. This is the case for much of the science of geology, as any of you who follow the work of Randall Carlson will know. The doctrine of uniformitarianism, or gradualism, was the emergent science's written goal for more than half a century during the 1900s. This is the idea that the Earth has always changed in gradual or uniform ways, and the relatively gentle, natural, and slow processes of things like erosion can be used to explain the landscapes that we see. For much of the science's early history, geologists sought to explain everything via these processes, in an effort to distance themselves from the catastrophism of religion, which prior to this time was the prevailing belief. I like to think of this period as something like a huge overcorrection, with the truth being much more likely to lay somewhere in between. Of course, nature's slow processes do shape landscapes over time, but free-thinking and rebellious geologists using modern science of the last 40 years or so have demonstrated that catastrophism most definitely played a part. 
perhaps demonstrated nowhere better than the channeled scablands of eastern Washington state in the US. This incredible landscape was shaped in a very short period of time by unimaginably catastrophic flooding, and it took geology pioneers like J. Harlan Bretz his entire lifetime to win the battle against the orthodoxy of uniformitarianism. And today, his work is acknowledged in the Visitor Center for the Channeled Scablands, and his theories of catastrophism accepted. This is also the case for the Altiplano and the region surrounding Tiwanaku. In fact, Poznansky's research indicating that this area had suffered significant upheaval, severe climate change, as well as at least two periods of massive flooding is now being supported by geological studies conducted in the 1980s, as well as even more recent work investigating the effects of the cataclysm of the Younger Dryas period in South America. Poznansky describes a Tiwanaku, and in fact the area around Lake Titicaca, as consisting of three distinct periods of occupation interrupted by periods of cataclysm and flooding. His research included extensive excavations both at Tiwanaku and in areas around the massive lake, whose shoreline today is roughly 17 kilometers or 10 miles from the ruins of the metropolis. Quoting Poznansky, quote, The face of the earth has, with the passage of time, undergone great transformations. As a matter of fact, our knowledge about the origin of humanity is extremely limited. The deeper we penetrate with the aid of science into the secrets of creation, the more we realize how little we know and how far we are from solving these mysteries. Geology of the present day believes that the chain of the Andes, which surrounds the Altiplano, has undergone great transformations, that during some periods it submerged to a certain point, while during others it rose. We cannot stop to prove these assertions. Only future serious South American geological studies will shed some light on this matter. The only fact established up to this time is that the mass of the South American continent is rising, and with it the Andean Altiplano, which, in remote periods, when its level was less than it is now, was the seat of a flourishing culture. As a result of an elevation, either abrupt or gradual, the ground today occupied by Lake Titicaca and the adjacent lands south and southeast of the lake, the greater part of the waters of the Andean lakes poured out. After this formidable flow, there remained a relatively small amount of salt water in the basin of Titicaca, so that its level was much below the present one. In the period following, we find the first traces of man's culture on the Altiplano, or rather on the banks of the pre-Titicaca. Somewhat later, we perceive a rapid rise in human development, manifested in the fact that man constructed on the banks of the lake, banks which are at the present time covered with water, primitive buildings of wrought stone. The first conclusive and indisputable proof which can be brought to bear in this connection is that Lake Titicaca, due to the great diminution of its waters, reveals today ruins of wrought stone which correspond to an epoch much before that of the Tiwanaku of the second period, and consequently to a stage which was perhaps the mother of the Tiwanaku of the first period. As is apparent from this fact, there can be found no more conclusive proof that in the epoch which preceded the Tiwanaku of the second period, the volume of Lake Titicaca was much less than in the time of the flowering of this great metropolis. End quote. Here, Posnansky describes the ruins of the first period, stone buildings both at Tiwanaku and around Lake Titicaca, although today they are under the water. At Tiwanaku, this period was characterized by the use of red sandstone as the primary building material, and many of the structures were semi-subterranean, being built into the ground. This period also seems to have been the genesis of an evolving art style that eventually culminated in the works of the Incredible Sun Gate, which is a calendar, originally less of a gate and more a part of a much larger wall. Although the site has been thoroughly pillaged over centuries, some of this first period art can still be found at the Christian church found at the site today. This church was built almost entirely from stone ripped from the ruins, and it houses these idols of the first period, supposedly of a man and a woman at its gate. In today's time, you can still see them there, albeit they are protected by fencing. Poznansky continues with the geological history of the region. Quote, Much later, a short glacial period occurred on the Altiplano, the residue of which, carried down by the glaciers, again closed the old drainage channels of the Andean Plateau. 
The waters from the melting ice then filled the basins and lower levels anew, covering the Altiplano almost in its entirety, to a height which corresponds today to nearly 3,845 metres, more or less, above sea level. With this considerable increase in its level, the lake covered nearly all of the Altiplano, which did not have even the inclination of 0.3 millimetres per metre towards the south, which it has today. End quote. Poznansky is here describing a short glacial period, followed by a warming and melting that greatly rose the level of the lake to the point much higher than it is today, in fact to a level that would have brought the waters to the very shores of Tiwanaku itself. As we will see shortly, the level of the water corresponded with the major building periods at Tiwanaku and Pumapunku of the second and third periods, when it was not only a city but also a harbour and Poznansky found the remnants of docks, as well as a sophisticated series of canals. Today, Lake Titicaca's level is some 35 or more metres, 90 to 100 feet, below this level, and we know the water was at this level thanks to a well-documented and researched strand line, which runs across the Altiplano. What's interesting about this strand line, something that is perhaps a good indicator of just how long ago this might have been, is that today it has a significant tilt to it, as Posnansky says, 0.3 millimetres per metre towards the south. This results in an 800 foot or 245 metre difference in elevation over around 375 miles of this strand line. Of course, this strand line was level when it was created by the water, and over time the geology of the Altiplano has shifted to give it this tilt. A book authored by H.S. Bellamy, published in 1943, entitled Built Before the Flood, which was very graciously sent to me by a patron, explored the issue of the tilting strand line further. Quoting Bellamy, quote, Perhaps the greatest and most puzzling discovery which was made in connection with Tiwanaku was that at the time when the buildings of the so-called Second Period were erected, the prehistoric metropolis was not a city sprawling upon a gentle rise in a wide valley, but one situated on the shore in a sheltered bight of a sort of peninsula. For Tiwanaku was a harbour city, the remains of whose key walls are still distinctly discernible, while a number of dock-like harbour basins and a canal can also be traced. And this strand line tells another and a very strange story. It has been carefully surveyed for a length of about 375 miles, and then it was established that it is not straight, the northernmost point at which the former strand line has been surveyed is on the mountain slopes near Silistani, to the west of Lake Umeo in the Peruvian department of Puno. There, the former littoral is about 295 feet above the present level of Lake Titicaca, whose surface is 12,506 feet above sea level. At Tiwanaku, in the southern end of Lake Titicaca, the same strand line is 90 feet above the level of that great sheet of water, and 4 feet below the coping stones of the parapets of the long dry harbours and docks and canals of that mysterious metropolis. The ancient strand line and the ruined prehistoric city are linked beyond any doubt. The height of the strand line relative to the ocean level decreases the further south we go. At the northern end of Lake Popo, on the mountain slopes south of Oruro, it is 12,232 feet above sea level, or 181 feet above the level of Lake Pupo, or 274 feet below the level of Lake Titicaca, or 364 feet below the level of the same ancient strand line in the latitude of Tiwanaku. End quote. It's worth emphasizing the scale of what we're talking about here. Lake Titicaca today is absolutely huge. 190 kilometres or 118 miles long, with a shoreline of over 1,100 kilometres or around 700 miles. When the water was 100 feet higher, and thus at the shores of Tiwanaku, it would have filled almost the entire Altiplano, and Bellamy termed it the, quote, Inter-Andean Sea. This diagram from his book illustrates these levels. The dark blue is the modern Lake Titicaca and Popo and the light blue corresponds to the level of water when it was at the shores of Tiwanaku. The yellow colour of the map is terrain over 14,000 feet. The tilting strand line of the higher water level exposes one of the several contradictions surrounding the orthodox dating of Tiwanaku, which was around 200 to 1000 AD. It's not just the strand line that confirms that the site was definitely a harbour, as mentioned by both Poznansky and Bellamy, Tiwanaku and Pumapunku still feature the remains of keys and channels. 
Poznansky's excavations at Timonaco also revealed the remains of fish and other aquatic species in the strata, some of the same species still living in Lake Titicaca, although in many cases significantly larger. So, given that the water that formed the strand line was once at the shores of Tiwanaku, which was a harbour, and given that water finds its level and that the strand line was once flat, and remembering the mainstream date for the end of Tiwanaku is around 1000 AD, is it likely that the geography of the Andes and the Altiplano have tilted to such an extent in over just the last 1000 years? Or is it far more likely that this process of tilting the strand line to its 800 foot delta from north to south has taken many thousands of years and that Tiwanaku was constructed far earlier. It's an interesting problem and one I hope to discuss with other researchers and geologists who might help to shed some more light on the enigma of the tilting strand line. Another challenge with our modern and relatively young dating for Tiwanaku has to do with the current climate of the Altiplano. Today an arid and inhospitable place not at all conducive to supporting the large population and civilization required to construct such a metropolis. Recall that Poznansky referred to a short glacial epoch, which he speculates caused the end of the first period of occupation. He's not talking about the deep ice age of the Pleistocene here, but rather something else, something much shorter in duration. Keep this point in mind, as we'll return to it later. The fact remains that the current inhospitable climate of the Altiplano could not have been that under which Tiwanaku flowered and thrived, which it obviously did. The climate must have been very different during Tiwanaku's prime, and one of many lines of evidence for this is that today there can still be found the remains of terracing on the surrounding mountains. Terracing that goes right up into the current and permanent snow line. This is no good at all for agriculture now, but these terraces must have been used for that in the past, which is a clear indicator for a more benign climate, one that could have supported such a civilization. Arthur Poznansky covers this in significant detail in his book, and we resume with him describing the situation faced by the second and third periods at Tiwanaku. Quote, It is necessary to keep in mind that, after a short glacial epoch, which was the principal cause of the extinction of the first period at Tiwanaku, the Altiplano and its mountain range went through a period where the glaciers were reduced to a minimum and covered only the highest peaks of its mountains. It is therefore natural and correct to presume that there existed a benign climate. This was a favourable circumstance which made it possible for the man of the Altiplano to dedicate his activities and energy to the construction of a gigantic and sublime work the ruins of which we admire today with astonishment and respect. Without the necessity of having to dedicate all his energies, as he does now, to acquiring his daily bread, and without suffering the annoyances and consequences of a harsh and inhospitable climate, he was in a position to carry out the stupendous work of Tiwanaku. After the refilling of the basin of Lake Titicaca took place, the content of which was no longer salty but brackish due to the great quantities of water from melting ice which were added to it, man's culture evolved extraordinarily. It extended not only along the shores of the Great Lake, but spread over the numerous and extensive islands also. Then it was that Tiwanaku man reached the apogee of his development, or in other words, at the end of the third period. During this last lapse of time, the lake was extended to the very outskirts of the prehistoric metropolis. This is a fact which has been proven, without any scientific refutation, by the complicated system of canals which exist until today and which are in direct communication with the bed of the lake, surrounding all of Tiwanaku. The docks of the port of this city are visible at the present time. These docks of the prehistoric Andean city are situated 34 meters 73 centimeters above the level of the present lake. We know that with an increase of 34 meters in the level of the lake, almost all of the Altiplano would have been inundated, leaving visible only in the manner of islands, the locations which would have been found at a height in excess of 3,845 meters above sea level. However, the still existing remains of the wharfs of the metropolis show where Lake Titicaca reached in the second and third periods of Tiwanaku. End quote. So, to summarize Poznansky so far, in deep antiquity, for whatever reason, Lake Titicaca was emptied to a level much lower than that of today, and in those low levels we find the traces of the first period. 
At some point later in time, the region went into a short glacial phase, ending the first period. But then the climate warmed and improved, and the ice melted, and it filled the basin to a level above the current lake, and to the shores of the site of Tiwanaku, giving rise to the second and third periods. These inhabitants of the second and third period were those responsible for the famous mystifyingly megalithic work whose remnants attract interested people to this remote place to this day. The hard andesite pieces, with many intricate, perfect inside corners and meticulously flat surfaces, surfaces that have been shown to approach the flatness of glass, have been measured down to but a few microns, thanks to the work performed by Patrice Poyard in his excellent documentary, Builders of the Ancient Mysteries. The second period also did work with red sandstone, with one monolith at Pumapunku weighing in at an estimated 400 tonnes, and in places these also feature the same tiny precision drill holes as do some of the andesite blocks. The second period was responsible for creating the major elements at the site. The solar observatory, known as the Kalasasaya, the stepped pyramid of the Akapana, as well as Pumapunku. The third period is distinguished by the efforts to renovate, repair and extend these works, and by the fact that they only worked in andesite. One thing Poznanski is very clear about, and that his research demonstrates, is that there was no long period of degeneration or decay of this civilization. It seems to have ended abruptly, with many works left unfinished, the ambitious projects of the third period never completed, and Tiwanaku emptied. What could have happened to these people? To find out, we return to Poznanski's work. Quote, Signs which leave no room for doubt show that outside of the Great Lake there existed, farther to the north, a number of smaller bodies of water, whose level was higher than that of the main lake. During one of the frequent seismic upheavals, the counterforts which held back the waters were opened, and as these lagoons were at a higher level, the waters were precipitated into the main lagoon. As a result, the level of the latter was temporarily augmented. As a consequence of one of these catastrophes, the Tiwanaku of the third period must have disappeared. During the many thousands of years which have transpired since the building of the monuments of the third period of Tiwanaku, the Altiplano has risen notably, as has been proven by conscientious and trustworthy observations. Consequently, the elevation, 3,847 metres above sea level, which is that of the ruins at the present time, was not the same during the flowering of the Andean metropolis. End quote. So, according to Poznansky, the great civilization of the Altiplano was eventually ended thanks to another massive flood that emptied higher elevation bodies of water into the Altiplano. There is another tilted strand line reported by Bellamy's work, one that is much higher than the intermediate level at the shores of Tiwanaku, several hundred feet higher. This seems like a tremendous volume of water, one that would require a truly significant source. I don't think this is the strand line representing the flood that Poznanski is referring to. He seems to be referring to a more transient but still catastrophic flooding event. That Tiwanaku was in fact flooded is eminently clear when you visit the site today as much of it is still buried in alluvium, and even from Poznanski's original images, you can see that the site has been destroyed and blocks scattered everywhere. Walking around Tiwanaku and Pumapunku, in many places you can find the tantalizing prospect of precisely shaped megalithic blocks barely poking out from the reddish soil. It bears mentioning that almost all of what we can see today at Tiwanaku has been excavated from the ground. And much of the site, particularly the Kalasasaya, has been rebuilt by modern hands in recent decades using material brought in. I've heard it said on other channels and by some people something to the effect of there is no erosion at Tiwanaku so it can't be that old. This is flat out false. Parts of Tiwanaku and Pumapunku show very great erosion indeed, as these were the elements from the site that were left exposed to the weathering of millennia. It's something that Poznanski commented extensively on in his work, and in fact he points to this as an indication of the very likely great age of the site. Andesite really doesn't erode very quickly, and certainly not in climates like the current one of the Altiplano. Because so much of the site was buried in alluvium or floodborne sediment, ultimately this had the effect of protecting and preserving the stones. A good example of this is the famous Sun Gate itself. It was found buried, face down, with only a portion of the back corner exposed, a corner which we can see today is quite badly eroded, 
while the incredible artwork on its face remained preserved. It was doubly lucky that it fell face down, probably from the flood, as had any of the artwork been visible when the Spanish conquistadors rampaged through here, it would have been utterly destroyed. As it is, they were the most likely cause for it being broken in half. Unfortunately, the damage wrought by the Spanish was only a small part of the destruction this ancient place has endured. Much like many other repositories of finely worked megalithic material, like the Great Pyramids of Giza or the gigantic polygonal walls of Peru, the stone blocks have been prized as building material by careless men and cultures who care nothing for the past, seeking only to enrich themselves. The stone of Tiwanaku has been carried off the site for centuries and used in the construction of many structures and houses in the city of La Paz, in temples across the Altiplano, and in the building of railways, sewage systems, bridges, and even mining machinery. In 1540 AD, Chiesa de Leon visited the site, the earliest known written account of Tiwanaku, and it must have been quite a vision. Quoting Poznansky, quote, Chiesa de Leon, who personally visited the celebrated ruins of Tiwanaku in the year 1540, saw still standing great ramparts and walls which have now disappeared from the surface of the ground, and the traces of which the archaeologist can establish only by drawing up topographical maps. Since then, centuries have passed over these venerable spots, and in the course of this time, clumsy human hands have accomplished a much more destructive work than was effected in thousands of years, either by the ceaseless action of natural phenomena or the tireless and devastating labour of time itself. Sacrilegious hands have torn away these precious monuments, a testimony of prehistoric energy and genius, destroying the eloquent remains of the one-time splendour and glory for whole centuries, these monuments were looted to construct houses, temples, bridges, etc., not only in La Paz, but in other localities. Not without grief and indignation could one see, even a few years ago, how wagons reached La Paz daily, loaded to overflowing with those precious American relics, which were employed as construction material for a building which was being erected in the main plaza. And, casting a glance back some two centuries, we see how the commissions sent by the clergy for the extirpation of idolatry devastated the monuments of Tiwanaku. Later, Alonso de Mendoza and his followers built with this same material, so well cut and so easy to obtain, the first part of the new city of La Paz. And this very same material is still used to build temples in a great part of the Altiplano. But even more damaging for the ruins of Tiwanaku than the devastating action of time, of natural phenomena, the work of the builders of cities and the zeal of fanatic guardians of the Christian religion, have been the excavations of Georges Corti, 1904. Of all that which this inept and unscrupulous searcher may have disinterred in his excavation, there remains today not a stone in its place. The beautiful tiles of the Cloaca Maxima, today serve as paving stones in the square of the village, and the stones carved with ornaments and the blocks of the coloured peron were carted off by the managers of nearby country properties to be embedded as decorations in the walls of the houses on the estates. Upon the occasion of each new visit to Tiwanaku, until a few years ago, one missed some of the old things and noted new traces of the labour of devastation caused by criminal hands from the village itself. The theft of the stones was increasing every day and, had it continued, there would have been lost in a short time these remains of the remote civilization which must be called upon to illuminate completely the study of American prehistory. But, due to the energetic action of the government officials during the terms of Pando, Montes, Villazon, Saavedra and Salamanca, an action without which there would exist today almost nothing of these ruins, such vandalic destruction was, to a certain extent, stopped. End quote. Poznansky is spitting some literary fire there, but you can clearly hear his passion for the site and for its preservation. Although he gives the government the ultimate credit for protecting the site, it was his ceaseless lobbying of them that ultimately drove that action. And today, Tiwanaku is safe with a UNESCO World Heritage designation. It's worth noting here that the Tiwanaku of today is very different to the Tiwanaku of Poznansky's time. As mentioned earlier, much of it has been rebuilt and reconstructed. Just compare these photographs from Poznansky's works of the great solar observatory of the Kalasasaya to those taken during my several visits to the site. 
Only a few of the huge monoliths were left standing, and today the gaps between them have been reconstructed using smaller blocks brought into the site. I think it's possible, indeed likely, that the entire Kallus Asai was composed of such large monoliths originally. The famous sunken temple with the idol of Wirakosha in the center and the stone heads in the walls is almost entirely reconstructed, with the original stones and heads located in a museum in La Paz. But some of the larger stones in the perimeter are original, with the faint outline of high relief carvings giving a hint to what might have once existed here. The Cloaca Maxima that Poznansky referenced in the last quote was his name for the reservoir or the dam that sits in the center of the Acapana stepped pyramid. Today it's just a dry depression in the center of the structure. This was once connected to an elaborate series of channels and was fully tiled in andesite. Some of Poznansky's images here show a few of these stones, the same ones that later disappeared, presumably pilfered as building material. These older images speak to me of some sort of functional purpose. Indeed, much of Tiwanaku and Pumapunku has an almost industrial feel to it. One block in particular, found behind the Akapana today, I think demonstrates the use and control of water. It's an andesite piece with the remnants of elaborate carving on the front. It's covered in tiny, precise drill holes that may have once held something else there. And the back of the block is curved such that, at least to me, seems to indicate something hydrodynamic, perhaps a sluice gate of sorts. I call it the super block as it has so many interesting features and I'm looking forward to another closer look at it in the near future. Despite all of the destruction, quarrying, theft and careless excavation that has occurred here, there fortunately does seem to be much yet to be discovered at Tiwanaku. In recent years, there have been reports of an entirely buried pyramid found via ground penetrating radar, as well as an entirely underground citadel that might take more than 50 years to excavate. Terrain mapping drones have revealed the huge extent of what might still be buried in sediment here yet to be uncovered. The site itself likely extends underground also, local rumours talk of staircases going down into the ground, and tunnels going beneath the Akapana pyramid have been explored with robots, but results from such tests are extremely hard to find, and the tunnels have since been resealed and hidden. So before we get into the astronomical dating of Tiwanaku, let's quickly cover another couple of points made by Poznansky that speak to a potentially vast age for the complex. He identified remains from Tiwanaku in the same strata layer in the soil that also contained a skull from a toxodon, an elephant-sized hoofed mammal that existed in South America during the Pleistocene and went extinct around the time of the Younger Dryas, roughly 11 to 13,000 years ago. Some of the artwork at Tiwanaku also seems to point to other extinct species from this period. There are many depictions of large cats amongst the carvings, which today are all classified as pumas. But in that case, as Poznansky points out, why do only some of these show cats with very large canine teeth, while others do not? Is it possible that these represent both pumas and smilodons, the so-called saber-toothed tiger? The name saber-toothed tiger is a bit of a misnomer. They aren't closely related to the tiger at all, but they did exist in South America and were one of many megafauna who went extinct at the end of the Pleistocene. Now, the primary method that Poznansky used to pin a date of 15,000 BC to the second period at Tiwanaku was astronomical dating, based on changes in the obliquity of the ecliptic, analyzing the alignment of the solar observatory, known as the Callus Asaya, to the precise locations on the horizon of the sunrise during the solstices. The ecliptic is the plane projected by the Earth's orbit around the Sun, more or less the disk in which all of the planets orbit. The obliquity of the ecliptic is the angle between the plane of the Earth's equator and the plane of the ecliptic. As most people know, the Earth's axis is tilted, so that angle today is approximately 23.5 degrees. This tilt in the Earth's equator gives us the seasons as we orbit the Sun. 
Summer in the Northern Hemisphere occurs when it is tilted towards the Sun, and six months later, on the other side of the Sun on our orbit, it's tilted away, so it's cooler and hence winter. The degree of this tilt is not fixed, however. There is a slight oscillation to it, and its value swings between 22.1 degrees and 24.5 degrees, in a cycle that takes around 41,000 years to complete. This motion of the change in the Earth's tilt is but one of several long-term motions of the Earth, loosely known as Milankovitch cycles. With careful analysis, and due to this change in the obliquity of the ecliptic, the exact location on the horizon of the sunrise changes, very gradually, over time. The solar observatory of the Kalasasai was constructed as a marker for the sunrise on the solstices, the longest and shortest days of the year. Poznansky set out to measure the difference in the ubiquity of the ecliptic at sunrise on the solstices between his time, around 1930, and when the alignment would have been precisely matched to the construction of the Callus Asaya. It turns out that the structure also aligns with the locations for the sunsets on the solstices, I think making it undeniable that the Callus Asaya is absolutely a solar observatory and not just some sort of coincidence, but this discovery would only be made long after Poznansky had passed away. In his efforts at using this technique to date Tiwanaku, Poznansky enlisted the methods of Sir Norman Lockyer, one of the pioneers of astroarchaeology. Quote, Since olden times and also in our day, the question regarding the age of Tiwanaku is one which has fascinated scholars and laymen alike. Since these ruins were already debris in the period of the Inca Empire, capricious commentaries and conjectures were made about their existence and the men who built them, and especially about their age. Thus it is that until a little while ago, the chronological aspect of Tiwanaku constituted an almost indecipherable enigma. Only after conceiving the idea of investigating the age of these remains of human activity in prehistoric America, the most notable ruins which have come down to us, and using astronomical resources to this end, has a slight ray of light penetrated this mystery. It is not a new thing to study the age of archaeological monuments by astronomical means. Perhaps the person who carried out this class of investigations with most skill and understanding was Sir Norman Lockyer, President of the Physical Solar Observatory of London, who, in 1909, in his detailed work Stonehenge and Other British Stone Monuments, supplied the necessary foundation for the methodological investigation of the epochs in which there were constructed the monuments of remote antiquity. In these works, which we can call definitive, the author employed the method of approach of the learned Sir Norman Lockyer, or, specifically, used exclusively as a basis for the calculations the change of the obliquity of the ecliptic. In other words, the comparison of the ecliptic marked on the Temple of the Sun of the second and third periods, and that of the present time. Through the facts expounded in the preceding chapters, it has been proven beyond all doubt that the Temple Callus Asaya was a true solar observatory located on the astronomical meridian, and at the same time a magnificent stone calendar. For reasons also set forth in previous chapters, it has been noted that when the observer stands at the center of the west wall of Callus Asaya of the second period, the north and south pillars at the east wall are so located that the sun would rise at the solstices on the outer corners of these pillars. Also, approximately at the center of the building, let us say at the middle of the monumental peron, the sun appears on the morning of the equinoxes. Now then, if, at the solstices, one observes the sunrise without the aid of instruments, it will be noted that it does indeed still come up at the corners of these pillars. However, if we examine this phenomenon with precision instruments, we note a difference of approximately 18 minutes, which represents the change in the obliquity of the ecliptic between that of the period in which Callus Asai was built and that which it has today. This difference has served as the basis for the calculation of the age of Tiwanaku. End quote. Poznansky spent years on the site carefully examining the alignment of the Callus Asaya, and also enlisted the help of several astronomers, like Professor Rolf Muller from the German Astronomical Mission, who spent several years on site confirming his results. The 18 minutes of difference in the obliquity of the ecliptic that is currently shown in the alignment of the structure was applied to the curve constituted by the formula of extrapolation recommended by the Ephemeris Conference of Paris in 1911. 
This formula produced a date of 15,000 BC, when the alignment would have been accurate, presumably the founding of the structure, which was built in the second period at Tiwanaku. When this date was published by Poznansky and by the astronomers from Europe that accompanied him, it was unsurprisingly met with fairly strong criticism, most of which just dismissed the findings with terms like absurd and with no scientific refutation. Jose Imbaloni, a supposed scholar at the time, attempted to debunk these results, but in his efforts, he confused the precession of the equinoxes with the variation of the obliquity of the ecliptic, two entirely different cycles, and also used incorrect measurements of the structure in his calculations by not distinguishing between the works of the second and third period. Not a good look. Poznanski's conclusions were confirmed by professional astronomers during his time, but despite this, he was well aware, almost prescient in fact, that both technology and our ability to make these observations might improve in the future, and that his work could be built upon. Quoting Poznanski, quote, We have not the least doubt that someday our measurements will be controlled by competent geodetists or astronomers, and possibly certain errors or omissions will be rectified, which escaped us through faulty personal judgments or for other reasons. In spite of this, we are convinced that the way has been opened for the study of the stone calendar and the foundations laid for the calculation of the age of Tiwanaku. We feel, also, that our observations will be of help to those who, in the future, establish themselves in the region under study, and, having the necessary time and resources, face the study in all its amplitude, correcting errors which we may have made, and thus shedding greater light on the purposes for which that magnificent temple and stone calendar was constructed, and on the age of these notable ruins." End quote. Poznanski's prediction that his work would be improved upon in the future was indeed correct. And here we can find a very interesting connection to something mentioned earlier, that of a brief glacial period followed by a benign climate on the Altiplano. In modern times, the same exercise of using astronomical dating and the change in the obliquity of the ecliptic at the Calis Asaya was undertaken, using much more accurate information computerized data, and the astronomical almanac, which gives us more reliable values for the changes in the Earth's tilt. Professor Neil Steed and Dr. Oswaldo Riviera analyzed not only the eastern sunrise points of the structure, but also the western sunset alignments for the solstices. They concluded that all four cornerstones of the monument had been accurately positioned somewhere around 10,000 BC. Dr. Riviera resigned from his post as director of the Bolivian National Institute of Archaeology shortly after this announcement, presumably as a result of this heretical observation, a not uncommon occurrence for anyone in professional academia who dares to step too far beyond the approved timeline. What's interesting to me is that this more accurate modern date, roughly 10,000 BC, corresponds very closely to a significant period in Earth's history, that of the Younger Dryas Cataclysm, occurring some 12,900 years ago. Most likely the result of multiple impacts from a fragmenting comet, it caused catastrophic climate change, drove the huge rise in sea levels, plunged parts of the world into glacial conditions for nearly a millennia, and corresponds to the extinction of hundreds of species of megafauna. In a previous video, we took a deep dive into the effects of the Younger Dryas on South America by analysing a recent scientific paper looking at a site in Chile. The link to the video is below. Not only did this study show significant impact proxies in the strata, it indicated a massive extinction event in South America of more than 80% of megafauna, and it demonstrated a dramatic change in climate, both up and down the average temperature scale in various regions. When we combine the modern astroarchaeological date of 10,000 BC or 12,000 years ago, the Younger Dryas Cataclysm of around 13,000 years ago, and Poznansky's reporting of both brief glacial periods and consequent dramatic climate change, we can start to paint a picture for what might have occurred here. Is it not possible that the Younger Dryas Cataclysm itself brought on the glacial conditions that ended the first period at Tiwanaku? As temperature graphs show, this cold period was geologically very brief, around a thousand years, and then the Earth warmed very rapidly. As the glaciers melted in the Andes, filling Lake Titicaca to the shores of Tiwanaku, the climate had also warmed. Could this time in the past have given birth to the bounty of the second and third periods at Tiwanaku? 
This warming would have taken place right around 10,000 BC, which corresponds to the alignment and astronomical dating of the site. I think Poznansky might well have been right in his assertions for the vast age of Tiwanaku, and it seems like modern science, particularly in fields outside of archaeology, are agreeing with him. It is just speculation, but very much like Plato's story for the sinking of Atlantis at 9600 BC, aligning with Meltwater Pulse 1b and the end of the Younger Dryas, it is quite a remarkable coincidence that the dates for Tiwanaku line up so very well with those produced by modern research into the cataclysm of the Younger Dryas. Against all this evidence for a more ancient origin of Tiwanaku, Mainstream academia has used a few C14 radiocarbon dated remains and the results of a process called obsidian hydration dating to outright dismiss Poznansky's work. While these methods are undoubtedly useful, they're also not without their drawbacks. Carbon-14 dating doesn't work on stone and may only give you dates for the last campfire or for the last person to be interred in the ground. Both carbon-14 and obsidian hydration dating also rely on the use of constants in their calculation, when in reality these constant values can vary over time. Cosmic events, supernovas or solar activity can affect the rate of carbon decay, and obsidian hydration dating assumes a constant rate of water absorption, which, as we've seen, likely varied in the extreme on the Alta Plano as it underwent significant climate change over time. On the other hand, Poznanski undertook a huge multidisciplinary approach, combining geology, astronomy, cultural, anthropological and paleontological methods over 50 years to come to his conclusions. He dedicated his life to studying and to preserving the great enigmatic ruins of Tiwanaku and Pumapunku, and he and his work deserve to be taken seriously. Amongst the amazing relics of ancient civilizations, Tiwanaku stands as unique. There's nothing quite like it found anywhere else on the planet. So was Tiwanaku, as Arthur Poznanski labelled it, the cradle of American man? There's certainly plenty of evidence to suggest that it might well have been, and that it may well be far older than our modern orthodox dating suggests. Hopefully, future generations of researchers and archaeologists can continue to work on this site with open minds, considering the full impact of adjacent sciences, to uncover the truth that likely lies still undiscovered, waiting patiently beneath the sediment and soil of the remote altiplano of the Andes. Thanks for watching. Well, there we have it. I hope you enjoyed that look into some of the evidence for an older dating of Tiwanaku. It's probably fair to say that this video has been in the works for a couple of years now. I think I produced that first video on Tiwanaku and Pumapunku back in 2019. And it's really taken that much time to kind of research and get into Poznanski's works, which, as you might be able to tell, were quite extensive. I will be sharing uh, the images from the, the books as well as a few of the chapters that I referenced. Uh, in the video with patrons and channel members and people who support uh, my work through that value for value model. So if you're interested in that type of thing or in supporting the work that I'm doing here at Uncharted X uh, via that value for value model, there's lots of details on the way you can do that. It's all on my website. It's unchartedx.com slash support. A quick update on upcoming trips. I will be joining Randall Carlson along with the Brothers of the Serpent, Colin Russ and the Grimerica guys, as well as David Matheson, Brandon Powell, uh, in the channeled Scablands, looking at the catastrophic landscapes of the Ice Age mega floods with Randall. Uh, that trip is happening in late September. You can find all the details for that at contactatthecabin.com. And I'll also be doing another trip to Egypt in October of this year. I think there's still some spots available for that. If you're interested in that, there's a post on my website. Uh, you can check out all the details there. And lastly here, I just wanted to give a special shout out and thank you to the producers for this episode. These credits are real credits. They work the same way as credits do in Hollywood. Uh, you can put them on your LinkedIn or really anywhere else that accepts producer credits. Starting with the executive producers for this episode, Mark Rendina. Mark, thank you again for uh, your support. Uh, greatly appreciated. I'm looking forward to catching up with you again in Egypt this year. Cortez Studio, also a long-term supporter uh, of the channel. Thanks so much, Cortez Studio, for uh, your support of my work. It's much appreciated. 
Daniel Sindoni is an executive producer for this episode. Thanks so much for all the support, Daniel. Uh, it's much appreciated. I know you send in a few contributions over PayPal. Uh, yeah, greatly appreciated. Thanks so much. Now for the associate executive producers for this episode, Ralph Robinson. Thank you so much, Ralph. Ellie Cahill. Thank you so much, Ellie, for the support. Martin Hess. Also, Martin, thank you so much for the support. Uh, and also want to give a special shout out to uh, JR, who runs the Ancient Sanctum. Uh, YouTube channel, as well as Dan from Queensland in Australia, uh, big supporters over in my Twitch channel, which I do stream at several times a week if you're interested in that. All right, guys, I hope you enjoyed the video and I'll see you in the next one. Cheers.